We thank you for your word. We praise you that your word is true. And we pray, Father, that your spirit will be with us to guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, we had gotten to about verse 8 in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 19, is that right? Yep. Okay, and uh, we're going to pick up right where it says, and all the people came before the king, which is toward the end of verse 8. The next sentence in the English Standard Version says, Now Israel had fled every man to his own home, and all the people were arguing throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us from the hand of our enemies and saved us from the hand of, Philistines, of the Philistines, and now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. But Absalom whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now therefore, now therefore, why do you say nothing about bringing the king back? So what are, they, what are they wanting to do here? Now this is Israel who had rebelled against David. They had anointed Absalom the king in David's stead while David was still alive. They lost the battle. Absalom is, is gone. And what are the what are these these tribes that were in rebellion wanting to do now? Huh? They're going back to their ex. Go back to their ex. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The wanting they're, 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 you, you got to give them this. They were wanting to reestablish the kingdom that they had tried to depose. Okay. And Dave, and King David sent this message. Huh? Right. Yes. Okay. They wanted to be reconciled, if you will. No. I mean, I know there's levels of, of, of that. Yes, Matthew. It is interesting as we've gone through this story. We read about Absalom's plot where he was the one luring people away from David before they even could get to the gate of the city. He stole the hunt. He spent years doing that, but we never actually read of David doing anything bad or wrong as a king for the country to where people would want to leave him. So that makes us very interesting that they go, oh, David's the one who saved us from our enemies. David was our king before. It seems like he was a good king while he was reigning for those years. Mm -hmm. So they may not have had an actual reason to leave him. So now they're going back to him. Well, and all of that brings up, we could actually have another discussion about how Absalom lured, lured him away. His, his uh, flattering words, his uh, subtle submarining of David. Uh, if only you had somebody to advocate for you, I'll advocate for you. Yes. Well, it also shows the point of the people were wanted to be led by a king and not necessarily by God. Okay. Yeah. Mm hmm That all goes back to the very beginning of the establishment of the kingdom, doesn't it? <clears throat> they were warned. They were warned. They did know God had anointed David. In fact, it said, Absalom, whom we anointed over us. Did you notice that acknowledgement? We anointed him over us. Okay. So, they're going to bring the king back. Whatever their motives were, and I'm sure as many people as were there, there were many varieties of motives. I think it's good that they wanted to bring King David back. And King David sent this message to Zadok and Abiathar, the priests, say to the elders of Judah, why should you be the last to bring the king back to his house when the word of all Israel has come to the king? You are my brothers. You are my bone and my flesh. Why then should you be the last to bring back the king? And say to Amasa, are you not my bone and my flesh? 
God do so to me and more also if you are not commander of my army from now on in place of Joab. And he swayed the heart of all the men of Judah as one man so that they sent word to the king, return both you and all your servants. So the king came back to the Jordan and Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. So, so we've got this overture from the rebellion, the tribes that were in rebellion, the, the Israel, okay, to bring him back. And what is David's response? What does he say to Judah? Well, what's going on here? Why are you the last ones? You're my, you're my bone. You're my flesh. And then even to Amasa, he says, "What did he say? What's what's Amasa's?" Uh, Promotion that he's given. He's taking Joab's place. Did David have ample reason to kind of be fed up with Joab? Yeah. Rightly or wrongly, he 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 thought he thought Amasa would be a better one. And again, what what is the what's the words he say to him? Um, Are you not my bone and my flesh? God do so to me and more also if you're not commander of my army from now on. In the place of Joab. Yes, uh, Gary. You had your uh, hand up. He appointed uh, a man just because he was still smarting over Joab's rebuke. But when we look at the big picture, Joab was loyal mm -hmm. and he was a highly competent general. Mm -hmm. And Amasa was just the opposite. He was a traitor and very incompetent. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I might have forgotten something. Had Amasa, had Amasa been taken, had he taken part in the rebellion against Absolutely. David? Absolutely, yes. Wow. Yes. All right. In fact. Forgive me for forgetting that. Yeah. Absalom okay. put him in charge. That's right. Of a 40,000-man army, and they lost by an army of one-tenth the size. <laughs> They totally did not prepare right. for a surprise attack. Wow. Wow. All right. <laughs> so, you think the prophecy, the sword is never going to depart from your house, is still playing out here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so there they are. The king came back to the Jordan. Judah came to Gilgal to meet the king and to bring the king over the Jordan. So who is leading? Who is at the front of the line when David is returning back to uh, his uh, kingship? Judah. The last to come home is the first in line. Yeah, yeah. Verse 16, and Shimei, Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite. Y'all remember Shimei? What did he do? He cursed the king when he, yeah, he cursed the king. That's right. I'm, I may be repeating what you say because sometimes I've noticed on YouTube it's not heard. So forgive me if I do that, but I'm doing that sometimes for the sake of people that are watching on YouTube so they can hear the comments you're making. So yeah, they were the first to, they were the last to come and the first to, to meet him. And Shimei, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, the one who cursed the king from Bahurim, hurried to come down with the men of Judah to meet the king, to meet King David. And with him were a thousand men from Benjamin and Ziba. Who's Ziba? What do we remember about Ziba? Huh? He took care of Mephibosheth. And what did he say about Mephibosheth when all this stuff was playing out? What did he, 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 he gave a slanderous report about Mephibosheth. What was it? He's a traitor. He said he's gone with, he's gone with Absalom because he's wanting to you know, get some of his. And David said to Ziba, everything that belongs to Mephibosheth now belongs, belongs to you. So Ziba has come back. And he had brought this report. The report really at this point hasn't been contradicted. So, you know, if, if we stopped right there reading the Bible, we wouldn't have any other uh, information about it. 
And Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, with his 15 sons and his 20 servants, rushed down to the Jordan before the king. And they crossed the ford to bring over the king's household and to do his pleasure. And Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king as he was about to cross the Jordan and said to the king, Let not my lord hold me guilty, or remember how your servant did wrong on the day my lord, the king, left Jerusalem. Do not let your, the king take it to heart, for your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to come down to meet my lord, the king. So, Shimei is saying what? I repent. I repent, and what else? Please don't kill me. <laughs> I'm sorry, please don't kill me. I, did, I, did I speak over you? Was that what you were going to say? He's groveling for his life. Yes. He realized what happened. Yeah. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah. Now, Abishai is whose brother? Joab's brother. Okay. Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answers, Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? But David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be as an adversary to me? Shall anyone be put to death in Israel this day? For do I not know that I am this day king over Israel? And the king said to Shimei, Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. Um, his response to, uh, to uh, Abishai was... Thoughts about that? Thoughts about his response? Yes? It's interesting in that it contrasts with how Saul responded after they had a great victory when Jonathan was told not to eat the honey and he ate the honey. Mm -hmm. Saul was still willing to kill his own son in that even though they had a great victory. And David, understanding that he has won, realizes there's no more need to cause problems and have these people die mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> but even though he gives him his word right now, later on, David will have a different story. There is vengeance later, yeah. Um, did, did you think it had David being a part of God? Are you really going to show that while he was, he was part of God? Yeah. His attitude toward the sons of Zeruiah? Any, any thoughts about that? I'll just tell you, I think he's getting frustrated with the sons of Zeruiah, with, with Joab and with, and with Abishai. Uh, he is, somebody said, I think earlier, he's still smarting over what happened with, uh, with uh, his son, Absalom. And this is not the first time David has not really agreed with Joab, especially. Um, it seems to me that there's kind of a love-hate relationship that David has with, uh, with Joab, and uh, especially Joab, and uh, by extension with Zeruiah because he's his brother. What, did Jesus, what name did Jesus give to James and John? Sons of Thunder. Sons of Thunder. It sounds kind of similar. You know, James and John were always ready to, uh, to destroy all enemies. And uh, Jesus was not ready to do that. And David, here, he wants to, for whatever reasons, again, he does harbor some ill will towards Shimei that he took to the grave, it appears. But he didn't kill him on this day, did he? And... And even when Shimei, Shimei met his demise, had he obeyed Solomon's directive, he would not have. He'd have just stayed in that city of refuge that he was in and, 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 and presumably never died. Or, well, died, but uh, by, in his bed. Yes? This is also interesting because back in 1 Samuel 26, Abishai was the one with David the second time David spared Saul's life. And in that, he did directly ask David, let me just go kill Saul. Let me go kill him. And it'll be over really quick. And David has to tell him no in that instance mm -hmm. as well. But now 
he's understanding in, in a different way, Shimei did deserve to die in a way for cursing gods, mm -hmm. to being wrong about it, leveling false charges about it, all of those things. Mm -hmm. But that would not have helped the situation right now. It was a day for mercy. And the king said to Shimei, you shall not die. And the king gave him his oath. Now Mephibosheth comes back. Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. He had neither taken care of his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety. Now what does that denote? He's not trimming his beard, not taking care of his feet, and he's not washing his clothes. What would that indicate in that culture we know what it would indicate in our culture you know you need a bath and you need to clean yourself up and you know but in that culture what was that signifying mourning mourning weeping fasting wailing sackcloth ashes all of that stuff he was mourning from the day the king departed until the day he came back in safety and when the king, and when he came to meet the king, the king said to him, why did you not go with me, Mephibosheth? Again, what story did David have in his mind from Ziba that he believed? What has Ziba told David? Remember a couple of weeks ago? Ziba, Mephibosheth's servant, had told David that Mephibosheth was a traitor. And that Mephibosheth was hoping to use this civil war to regain his own more power and authority over David. David heard that, he believed it, and he gave Ziba all of Mephibosheth's property. It's all yours. Okay, so when, so when Mephibosheth came before David, David believed he was meeting a disloyal person. He believed he was meeting a traitor. You see that? And he said, why did you not go with me? He answered, my Lord, O king, my servant deceived me. Well, your servant said to him, I will saddle a donkey for myself so that I may ride on it and go, go with the king. For your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my Lord, the king. But my Lord, the king is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. For all my father's house were but men doomed to death before my lord the king. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. What further right have I then to cry to the king? What do he say? I, I, I love this, what he says here. What, what is it that he said? Did he agree that he had rebelled against the king? He denied that. I didn't do that. But what did he say right after that? Right after he issued his denial, what was the next thing that he said? said? Didn't you listen that uh, they told him to ride the horse by himself and that he was a lima? Right. That's why he didn't Right. He gave his denial, right? But does he give a long speech denying all the things that, that, that he was accused of? It was short and sweet. He didn't say a whole lot in his defense other than saying, I didn't I didn't rebel against you. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't write out because I'm lame. Uh, and 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 um, Ziba slandered me. He didn't say that. Ziba slandered me. He he's lying. But did he even belabor that point? After he said his deny, after he issued his defense, what's the next thing that he said? He said in verse 27, but my Lord, the King is like the angel of God. Do therefore what seems good to you. He left it right in David's hands. He wasn't going to plead guilty to a sin that he had not committed. And you should never do that. Don't let anyone uh, uh, don't let anyone try to convince you that lying is ever going to serve you a good purpose. Uh, taking on a, 
taking on a um, guilt that is not yours is going to serve a good purpose. It's not. So he didn't, he didn't lie to say, well, I shouldn't have done anything. He didn't try to save his skin. He issued his denial of wrongdoing and trusted David to do what was right. You see that? In fact, he went on, what he did brag about was how good David had been to them. In fact, he said, I don't have any right to advocate for myself because I was, I mean, I, all my father's house were but men doomed to death. But you set your servant among those who eat at your table. You set me, so what, what right do I have? What right do I have to cry out for justice from you when you've given me unbelievable mercy? What mercy had he shown him? In fact, he, he remember when they found Meshibbeth? I knew I was going to say that. Mephibosheth? He asked, who can I show mercy? Who is there anyone left in the house of Jonathan or in the house of Saul that I can show mercy to for Jonathan's sake? Remember that? That's how Mephibosheth was found. David intentionally sought out Mephibosheth, didn't know who he was searching for, but he was searching for someone connected to Jonathan that he could take care of. So Mephibosheth knew of David's merciful acts toward him, to the, and he was so grateful. What, what, what do we see of his gratitude here? His gratitude, does, it, does his gratitude compel him to ask for more favors? Yeah. No. He's content. Now, that's a pretty good argument to make, really, if you know David. But at the same time, I believe he meant what he said. And the king said to him, Why speak any more of your affairs? I have decided. You and Ziba shall divide the land. And Mephibosheth said to the king, Oh, let him take it all, since my lord the king has come safely home. What does all this reveal about Mephibosheth? What's he showing us? Humility. Whole lot of humility. Yeah. He showed the same love to David that his father did. Mm hmm. Yeah. Amen. Um, that is a very Jonathan esque sort of. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. What does this show us about David? He could have disbelieved Mephibosheth. He'd already made his decision. He didn't really know the facts. He heard Zeba's testimony. He heard Mephibosheth's testimony. Did we have two or three witnesses? Didn't. Were the witnesses in agreement? They weren't. Yes? It, it's interesting because in, in Proverbs it mentions that the first to say his case sounds right until he's crossed his head. <laughs> and David's using context here that Ziba came first alone, mm -hmm. and then we have the whole thing with Shimei, and then he came first to, because he knew he did wrong in David's return. Mm -hmm. Ziba also showed up first when David came home because he knew he had done wrong. Mm -hmm. And the fact that one, Mephibosheth hadn't cared for himself, and also he made the argument that my servant deceived me because I told him to get a horse ready and then he just left without me right. because I'm lame and I couldn't do anything. Right. It, it, it all makes sense in this context where he didn't really have to look too far into it mm -hmm. to understand it, but it's also without all of the details, he just said, just split it and I'm not going to punish anyone today. Just, right. just let it be done. Mm -hmm. Jonathan. He'd be more inclined to love Mephibosheth. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the last we hear of Zeba, isn't it? Is that pretty much it? I don't know. There may be something else. 
Now Barzillai the Gileadite had come down from Rogalim, and he went on with the king to the Jordan to escort him over the Jordan. Barzillai was a very aged man, 80 years old. He had provided the king with food while he stayed at Mahanaim, for he was a very wealthy man. And the king said to Barzillai, come over with me and I will provide for you with me in Jerusalem. Okay, so what had Barzillai done for David? While he was on the wrong side of the Jordan, he had a whole, all, all his people had to be provided for. He needed to be provided for, and he fed them. Barzillai fed them. And what? That's right. All of their needs were met. And what did David want to do for Barzillai in response? Bring him to Jerusalem. You're going to be part of my court in Jerusalem, and I'm going to take care of you, buddy, because you took care of me. Yes? The same thing he did for Mephibosheth. Same thing he did for Mephibosheth. That's right. Take, he was going to take care of his friend. But Barzillai said to the king, How many years shall, have I still to live that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day 80 years old. Can I discern what is pleasant and what is not? Can your servant taste what he eats or what he drinks? Can I still listen to the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be an added burden to my lord the king? Your servant will go a little way over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please, let your servant return that I may die in my own city near the grave of my father and my mother. But here is your servant, Chimham. Chimham. Let him go over with my lord the king and do for him whatever seems good to you. And the king answered, Chimham shall go over with me and I will do for him whatever seems good to you and all that you desire of me, I will do for you. All right, so... Barzillai's uh, uh, rejection of the king's offer was based on what? But well, it's actually more of a moderation of the king's offer, not an outright rejection, really. I'm old. I can't enjoy this stuff. Let me go home. Let me die at home. Let me go to the house of my father and mother. And, and, and uh, this is, I'm, I'm past the age where all of this stuff is important, huh? doesn't matter. That's right. He's about to go to Sheol. He's about to be, uh, go before his God. He didn't want to be a burden to him. Didn't, he said that, right? He said that. Why should I be a burden? So this man who had done great things for David said, no. If you want to bless somebody, bless, bless this one. Bless Shimon. Shimon. And David says to him, in fact, this is interesting. He said in verse... Uh, Okay, here is your servant, Chimam. Let him go over with my lord, the king, and do for him whatever seems good to you. So who's the person that's going to be deciding, in Barzillai's opinion, who should decide what is going to be good for Chimam? David. Do, do whatever seems good to you. David said, Chimam shall go over with me, and I will do for him whatever seems good to you. So who will who did David say will be the decider of what is good for Chimam? Okay. Barzillai. He's gonna that, that's what David says. Da, Barzillai says, You do what you think is good for him. And David said, I'm gonna do what you think is good for him. That was David's gift to, to Chimam. Again, what do we learn about Barzillai in this situation? Does he sound like a greedy man? No. Arrogant? No. We don't see any of that. He tried to what David had done before. Huh? He trusted what David had done before. He trusted what David had done before. He believed in David and protected David. And again, what do we see from David here? He wants to reward his friends. And he wants to reward his friends in the way that they can accept the reward. Okay. Do you love people according to the way they need to be loved 
or do you love people according to the way you think they ought to appreciate being loved? <laughs> huh? Or the way that you need to love them. That's right. David wanted to, to love him in a certain way. Barzilla said, no, that's, not, that's really not going to work. And David accepted that. A lot of husbands wake up one day after many years of marriage thinking they've been loving their wives, but they haven't been dwelling with them according to understanding, and trouble ensues. You've got to understand the people around you and love them according to the way they appreciate being loved. Love languages, all that sort of stuff. It's, it's, it's a real thing. Now, <coughs> verse 39. Then all the people went over to the Jordan and the king went over. The king kissed Barzillai and blessed him and he returned to his own home. The king went on to Gilgai and Chimam went on with him. All the people of Judah and also <coughs> half the people of Israel brought the king on his way. So this is a big entourage that's going with David. Then all the men of Israel came to the king and said to the king, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away and brought the king and his household over, over the Jordan and all David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is our close relative. Why then are you angry over this matter? Have we eaten at the king's expense? Or has he given us any gift? And the men of Judah answered the men of and the men of Israel, again, the men of Israel, those were the ones in rebellion against David. Remember? Those were the ones who had appointed Absalom. Remember? Anointed Absalom. Remember? The men of Israel answered the men of Judah, we have 10 shares in the king. And in David also we have more than you. Why then did you despise us? Were we not the first to speak of bringing back our king? Is any cognitive dissonance in your minds about any of this? I mean, they had been zealously departing from David. They had been seduced by Absalom into leaving David, and now they're like angry that the loyal tribe that stayed with David is closer, as you might imagine they would be, than they are. Any thoughts about that? Sometimes like my kids argue. Sometimes like my kids argue. <laughs> it does. It just does sound childish. Yes. It does make sense in the context, though, because Israel was the first one to come back. So they were the first, really, to return to David and say, okay, we need to fix this. Mm -hmm. But then Judah sneaks in there, and they're like, oh, we'll escort the king across the river. We're going to bring him home. And they're like, but you guys took longer to come around to this than we did. That's not fair. That's all it is. It's, it's kids arguing it's not fair. That's not fair. We have more right today. To There's enough wrong to go around in all of this, isn't there? Now, <clears throat> and then you see the last part of verse 43. But the words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. So it sounds like uh, that's all we have in that chapter. It sounds like that the... the uh, that the uh, Judahites won the argument because they were meaner. Okay. What are we trying to do here? What, what, is, what, what, is, what is needing to be accomplished here? The nation had been in civil war. Community had to be restored. Unity had to be restored. Reconciliation needed to come. And to me, this is a very good... Yes, lots of forgiveness needed to be extended. This, it, to me, is a very good illustration of what can happen when we get at cross purposes with people. It's messy putting a kingdom back together. It's messy reconciling our differences. Uh, the one person who seems to be doing the most important things that need to be done is David who's not taking vengeance on an awful lot of people here. That's the one person I see. Others are crying out for vengeance or crying out for supremacy. Why did you get what I didn't get? Yes? It is interesting when we consider David after a man, a man after God's own heart. Mm -hmm. Because the way God 
describes himself in the book of Exodus, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. It says, The Lord passed before Moses and and the people and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. That's God's description of himself. Mm -hmm. David is following that very same pattern, showing mercy to those who need mercy and showing grace to those who need grace, but he's also not going to clear the guilty because though there is peace right now, he will visit that iniquity on them through Solomon. Yep. But even when you consider somebody like Barzillai, he tells Solomon to treat the sons of Barzillai very well and to keep them at his table. Mm-hmm. So he's rewarding the good and he's punishing the guilty and he's doing it all with equity and fairness and then all of that good stuff, just like God would. So he's really showing how his character and his heart is very much in line with God as he's rebuilding this game. There's a lot of people that seem to be playing their angles and trying to win in this in this thing. And David is the one extending the olive branch. He's the one extending going for peace. What does that say to us? Huh? Yeah. You and me have the same brain. I was just about to say that. Go thou and do likewise. That's right. We should we should do the same. We should learn to do the same thing. If we're going to be godly, and if and if our church is going to have great influence, forgiveness is going to be a big part of it. Because you have, have you done anything recently that needed to be forgiven? <laughs> you know, I go back to the last 24 hours. Yep, I got a couple. Probably more than a couple if I was more self-aware. Forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness. That doesn't mean we say evil is good or good is evil. Sometimes the forgiveness needs to be accompanied with truth telling. Sometimes you need to have the confrontation and you guys come to an understanding on the facts before forgiveness can be extended. Because sometimes you don't even know if you've offended somebody until somebody comes to you. That's that's why this morning what we're talking about going to your brother is so important. Rich. David knew that in order to uh, get God's kingdom back together, as a whole, mm-hmm. that he had to forgive. That you know, a divided, a, a divided nation would, would not survive. Right. Right. And so he had different kind of things that had to be appeased as well. You know, he had to show loyalty to the house of Judah. He was of the house of Judah, and they had saved his bacon, if you will. I guess not his bacon, but uh, uh, they had saved him. Okay. So he had to show loyalty to them. But he has also had to extend forgiveness and, to a degree, honor to the others who are coming back home. And our nation's recent history, uh, fairly recent, after the Civil War, you know, he had the same kind of dynamic that had to be worked out. There were radical, reforma- radical, uh, oh, what do they call that? Not reformation. Hmm. Not restoration. Reclamation. Not reclamation. In this, after the Civil War period, it begins with an R. The right. word was reconstruction. reconstruction. There were the radical. Thank you. There were the radical reconstructionists who were very, very harsh, and then there were some that, that were more soft in their in their tone. And then, you know, it was decades before the nation even began to start to try to be one again. Probably was a hundred years before really things begin to come together. Yes. Doesn't it say it sound like the prodigal son? Same sort of thing. Same sort of thing. It is. It is like the prodigal son. You know, the prodigal son did wrong. The father extended mercy to the prodigal son. The the older son was mad about it, and we don't know if he ever really uh, got over that. Like the book of Jonah, 
he didn't want he didn't want to see the the Ninevites uh, forgiven. So there's always hard feeling hard feelings following a, a war. So if we're going to be people of peace, I think David shows us something that we need to take with us every day. We need to be ready to forgive. Amen. Father in heaven, in Jesus' name, we love you. Continue to show us the truth that we may walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, chapter 20 next week.